Hi guys, welcome to Theater of CFG's Crime and Punishment, and today we're going ahead and do the whole book summary. Let's go. Now the whole book summary here technically is already split it into six parts, technically seven. However, here we're just gonna go ahead and talk about the whole thing as a whole. See, see what I just did there. All right, let's keep going. Now, first off, the part one summary. Now, part one here is about Raskolnikov going ahead and thinking that he's an uberman, thinking that he's going to be the next Napoleon. He thinks that he should be the next Napoleon, he should be the next moral person, the moral person, to do something that will later be regarded as moral, because he is one of the best people in the world, according to himself. His intellectualness and his, well, apparently his own enmity and his own personality goes ahead and, according to him, proves that he is one of the people who are just destined to go ahead, are better than other people, and will just go ahead and, well, be a better person. However, as we can see, Rasankov is, his name himself is actually derived from a Russian word that means divided, and he himself is going to divide himself up and divide his morality up too. His pride, as well, is one of the big fueling features of this of the, of his Uberman kind of phase, when he thinks he's a Superman. And by by Superman, we don't mean the Kryptonian from the DC comics that can literally do anything as long as he as long as he's supercharged by the sun. No, we mean the person who goes ahead and thinks that he's better than moral standards. He's better than every other human intellectually, and because he's better than every human. He can break all the moral things that he wants to do, but will not be punished because he's above God. And with that, he goes ahead and thinks that maybe he should become the judge, the jury, and the executioner all rolled into one. Except they're all pretty biased. So that's a little problem. His first victim was this pawnbroker who he realized she was scamming literally everyone. And because she was scamming everyone, he thought of her as a criminal and not even a human at all. He called her a principal that needed removal. He grabs an axe and goes in there, asks for her to pawn something, and there's an overly complicated knot, which she goes ahead and tries to unwrap, and forgetting that the door's still open, he goes ahead and murders her. Uh, after a few blows, that is. Now, I can't believe he forgot to close the door, but somehow he did. And then his sister, her sister came in the room, the pawnbroker's sister came in the room, saw that, and he kills her in one big blow to the head. He's like, what did I just do? I didn't mean to kill the sister. And also, also, why did I kill the pawnbroker? He goes and realizes the door is still open. He closes immediately as he realizes two people are walking there. And like, hey, whoa, who, who's in there? And he goes and hides the, hides, like hides the, hides himself. He forgets the axe, and they go and somehow force themselves in, and they find the body. And he's like, oh my goodness, they got it. I just murdered these people. And, he, and as. Well, as little as we know, he goes ahead and somehow escapes the building through the window of an art room studio. Next thing that happens, part two. He goes ahead and sees blood. He goes ahead, starts going ahead and visiting the crime scene where everyone's just going ahead and seeing things. And his psychological thing is starting to go ahead and become less of a greater person. This psychology thing is unfortunately terrible. He, his mental state is going down, and he's getting feverish. He, his landlord, his landlady technically, is going ahead and starting to press charges on him if he doesn't pay off his debts, and he has a lot of debts to pay off. With that, he goes ahead and tries to do something about it, but he's too feverish about the murder. He, he thinks himself as a cold-blooded and very rational person. However, he realizes that he's not the cold-blooded, rational person that we saw he was. He's a nice little warm-hearted, tended one with multiple colors, at least on the inside, and a bunch of feelings person. He's the one who can do things, too. But where did this come from? All of this actually goes ahead and shows that maybe it is just time to go ahead and do things, too. All that blood, all that psychology, too. He's starting to deteriorate. He goes into fever. Luckily, that makes the landlady, that comes the landlady enough to go ahead and push off his steps for a while because he's too sick to actually pay off anything and do anything. And all those moral things, well, Say bye bye to that because that's not happening at all. He thinks himself to be very immoral. He thinks himself to be better than the moral people. However, he really needs morals. Humans, if they break their morals, then they're not human anymore. They're not even better than humans. They're somewhat worse than humans too. Part three goes ahead and he starts going ahead and getting this mind game thing. There's this police officer who suspects he's the murderer because he's always guilty and whenever they talk about the murder, he goes ahead and tries to change the subject. 
and he's too feverish whenever he's around the crime scene too. He's also been to the crime scene several times. And with that, he tries to get a confession out of him. Yeah, I know you're a murderer. He goes and plays mind games with him and he's all like, Nah, I'm not playing with this joke. I'm not playing with this police officer. He goes ahead and goes away. And I'm thinking that police officer regrets all that immediately. Speaking of regret, next thing that happens all after all that regret, he goes ahead and starts thinking that maybe this is great too. Speaking of which, Rashonkov thinks that he's being haunted by the ghost of the landlady. Uh, correction, the pawn, the pawn broker. Of course, then he realizes Danya and Luzin are getting married, but he realizes Danya is only marrying Luzin for the money just so that they all can live a better life. He doesn't want that, that to happen. And he knows Luzin to be a cold-blooded person, and he's terrible, and Razumi Khan thinks so too, so they both treat Luzin very coldly. Because they both hate him. Next thing that happens is that Luzin goes ahead and does something. Next up, Svijigailov comes into the plot and says, I can help you break the tie between your Danya and Luzin. How? Well, uh, Luzin is a kind of family member of mine. Okay, I can break it, but there's one thing in exchange. What? I must marry Danya myself. Nah, that's not happening, bro. Fine, I'll do it, but just tell her, uh... I'll give her ten thousand. I'll give her ten thousand rubles just to go ahead and break up the engagement. She will not accept. Well, whether or not she accepts, she's gonna get three thousand anyway because that's in the will of my late, late, late wife. Oh, that's she's gonna accept. And that's it. Part six. Here we have interrogation. Finally, the police officers are playing the mind games again, and this time Raskolnikov is so annoyed that he just goes away in a huff. And then he Sonia goes ahead, comes into the plot. I'm, I just realized I haven't mentioned Sonia once in the story. Anyways, Sonia goes ahead and gets into this plot. He's been, she's been going on ahead and was with Razumi Khan for a while. She was also friends with the pawnbroker. And they go ahead and talk a little about each other's part lives too. And with this, she goes ahead and convinces him to confess. He goes to the police com oh, police station to confess, realizes the painter has already confessed, and thinks, maybe I shouldn't confess. But he remembers Sonia's... Sonia, and he remembers things too. He remembers that he should confess because that's the only way he can repent himself. And he confesses, and everyone's like, I knew it. And however, he is mentally ill, and he has done things, and he knows what he's done wrong too. And next thing that, so they go ahead and go easy on him too. On the judge and the jury day, they're all like confused how this guy forgets things too. But then the psychologist comes and says, well, he's mentally ill. And he's and he's clearly very guilted about the murder of the pawnbroker. Let's let's give it easy on this guy, man, people. Let's just give it on easy on this guy. And all those people go ahead. The jury goes ahead and goes easy on him. He's just sent to Siberia. That's it. The prison in Siberia. However, he seems to like it there. He doesn't mind the conditions much. And now he's starting to read the Bible again to go ahead and start being religious. And maybe even have a higher power to go ahead and listen to. And maybe even repent towards. Because he does. He does want to go into heaven badly. And that's it. That's Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Now you might have noticed that there's not much action in here. The action pretty much ends in part one. When he finishes murdering the old pawnbroker and her sister. However, this one. that does Just because the action's over doesn't mean that it, that the whole book's thriller part isn't over too. The psychology and the effect of words can still be powerful enough to go ahead and do things too. It's powerful enough to at least go ahead and power you enough forward so that you can go ahead and, well, repent and just not want to confess. And that's the whole book summary of Crime and Punishment's Fyodor Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. So I hope to see you guys soon in the next episode. I hope to see, well, you guys in the whole book review. And until then, shout out, peace. Bye-bye. Wear a helmet.